Good morning. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to have us do something that we haven't done in a year. Okay, y'all ready for this? I'm going to have you touch a hymn book. Okay, I'm going to have you pull that red thing out and uh, touch it. Turn it over to page 231. Turn to page 231. We're just going to sing the first verse of Jesus Saves. sound Jesus saves Jesus saves spread the tidings all around Jesus saves Jesus saves bear the news to every land climb the steeps and cross the waves onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves Jesus saves all right, we want to welcome you here this morning and have a word of prayer and let you know what's going on, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us for this time we can gather together. Pray your blessings on this time as we hear these two young missionaries and their hearts. We pray, Lord, you'll touch our hearts with what they have to say, and may glory be brought to your name in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, two missionaries this morning, we want to put them on the uh, web in case, again, a lot of people don't make it to Sunday school, they can go back and watch what they have to say and hear their hearts. The first young man is Blake Young, and he's going to come and give us a four minute video, and uh, then he's going to share with uh, his heart uh, going to Columbia. And I asked the guys if they were going to ship white flour our way after they get down there, if y'all know anything about Columbia, and they said that's part of of what the churches get that support them. But I'm, I'm kidding. Some of you are going, what are they talking about? Well, we'll see. Blake, come and share with us. I'm going to let you use this mic right here. Okay, buddy? Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Matt, we are Blake and Bridget Young, church planning missionaries to Columbia, South America. And about this time is where I would normally say, you know, how thankful we are to be here and how excited we are to be here. But your pastor and my used-to-be friend, Chesley Howell, did something to me yesterday that I thought y'all would appreciate as a church. Chesley gets down here a little bit early to help pastor with some work around the house. Come to find out he got there after the work was done. Typical missionary, right? And so then afterwards, pastor has the idea to have Chesley send me a picture of the meal that they're eating. And it just so happened to be this nice steak and baked potatoes. And I was at the uh, hotel last night. And you know what I had to eat, y'all? Had pizza. I know, how many of you feel sorry for me? Probably every one of you, right? Moochinaries, man. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and it really is exciting. This is the first meeting I've had with my friend Chesley. I'm excited to hear his presentation as well, but we'll show our video, and then we'll come up and speak just for a few more brief moments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to show you something similar to what I saw in Colombia, something that God used to break my heart. Miguel Sanabria took my friends and I to a school in Colombia where there was a statue of one of their saints. I remember seeing several school-aged children bowing down to it and they were praying in unison. While at the end of their prayer, one of the teachers ended up telling the students, you had to be good, you had to obey your parents, otherwise Mother Laura would not bless them. They could not go to heaven when they died. So who is this saint, Mother Laura? She lived for 75 years in the late 1700s and died in the early 1800s. She was a Catholic missionary to the indigenous people in South America. She would administer aid to those who were sick. She would reach out to the First Nation people. She would take in orphans and she would try to help them the best that she could. But she also believed that to be acquainted with Christ's sufferings, that she had to physically suffer as well. And one of the things that she would do is she would get this leather strap that had several nails in it. She would wrap it around her chest and begin beating those nails deep into her chest. But she didn't stop there. Another thing that she would do is she would take a rope and she would begin to beat her back. And she did it so much that a doctor told her that if she kept doing it, that it would ultimately take her life. And she died at the age of 75. And there are tens of millions of Colombians who are just like her. There are so many Colombian people who have such a strong zeal for their religion. They have such a burden to serve their God, but we know that they can't do that because they're dead and their trespasses and sins. The God of this world may have blinded their minds. He may have deceived them into thinking that their works, that their sacrifice, that their sufferings is honestly enough to get them into heaven, but we know that works is never enough. Well, that's where we come in. 
Satan may have hid the gospel for them and blinded their minds, but we know that the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ can shine into them. We know that God can show them that there is a savior unlike any saint. We know that there is a savior who died and rose again from the dead. We know that God can show them that there is a savior who has the power of life and death and that there is a savior who is alive today. But there's something else that God used to call us to Columbia. While we were there, there were two different families who were talking to Miguel and Mary Angela saying that they've been praying for so many years that God would just send a church that preached the gospel. They've been reading their Bibles and God showed them the light of the gospel and they began praying that God would just send them somebody in their area. We believe that Miguel and Mary Angela Sanabria are answers to their prayers and God has used them in a mighty way in Colombia with their church. But we also believe that God has called us for such a time as this. We also believe that God has called us to Colombia. God is doing something amazing in South America. Right now there are tens of thousands of Colombians who are leaving their religion, but they're not going to religions that preach the truth to them. They're going to religions that preach the same exact thing, that preach salvation by works because it appeals so much to their culture. But there's so few churches who are preaching the truth. I'm Blake and this is my wife Bridget. We're church planning missionaries to the country of Colombia in South America and we're sent out of Vision Baptist Church in Alpharetta, Georgia. When we first get to Colombia, our first two years is going to consist of learning the language and the culture and we'll be serving alongside of Miguel and Mary Angela Sanabria. And should God lead you to partner with us, after that time we want you to know that we'll start our very first church. That's something that we're very excited about. We will continue to serve our awesome God in Colombia and South America and we'll also train national pastors to carry the gospel throughout all of Colombia. We'll reach the lost with the gospel and we'll show them that there is one God, that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and we'll tell them that there is only one way to heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are the Youngs, church planning missionaries to Colombia. Amen. Um, before we briefly explain our video, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what God's done in my life first. Um, I wasn't raised in a Christian home to begin with, and uh, to tell you the truth, my mom, she wasn't either. I remember when I was around uh, 16 years old, my mom took me to the side in her room one day, and she looked at me and said, Blake, I didn't have the easiest life either growing up. And so my mom, she had all ears because it never occurred to me how she must have grown up before that day. She began explaining how she was raised by my grandparents, her mom and her stepdad, but she said as a child, she didn't remember there being very many happy days because of all the verbal arguments that took place. So one day as a child becoming a teenager, those verbal arguments became something much more physical where she would literally fight, pull air, my mom would sneak out of the house, and it wasn't a good home life to be raised in. Well, when she turned 16 years old, she looked at me and said, Blake, when I turned 16, I decided to do something crazy. My mom decided to take everything she could fit into her one suitcase, and she just didn't run away from home. She moved out to a completely different state to Florida, where she dropped out of my grandparents' lives for good. In fact, a few days later, she found out that law enforcement was looking for her. She gave my grandparents one last phone call, and she said, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what I've done. I can't take it anymore. I don't want to be in your life, so never contact me again. Goodbye. And she hangs up the phone. A few years go by, she tells me how she meets my dad, and, you know, surprise, here I am a few months later. I do want y'all to know before I go on that the greatest thing that ever happened to my mom was this good-looking guy right here, man. I was cute. Don't appreciate y'all laughing at that. <laughs> but that was exactly what she needed. But, you know, a few years went by. Um, I'm probably five or six years old now. I've got a younger brother, maybe four or five, that range. Our mom looks at us one day and she says, all right, now, boys, I want you to pack up everything you've got because you're going to spend the night with grandma and grandpa for a very long time. And I was excited about that. I really was. But, I, you know, I don't remember if a couple months went by or if it was just a few weeks. But what I do remember is I remember going up to grandma and grandpa one day when I'm still five or six. I remember walking up to them and saying, hey, when are we going back to stay with mom? But they looked at me and said something that hurt me because they looked at me and said, Blake, you're not going back to live with your mother because your mother doesn't love you anymore and she doesn't want to raise you. And I know you know what children are like, church, and I was no different. Began beating myself up over that, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I good enough for my mom? What did I do wrong? Why didn't she love me anymore? 
I spent a night with her, and she said, Blake, you're staying with your grandparents because they stole you away from me, and they don't want me to raise you boys anymore. And you know what was going on. Our grandparents wanted us against our mom. Our mom wanted us against our grandparents in church. I'll just speak for myself. As years go by, I ended up hating both of them for what happened. I hated my grandma and grandpa for taking me away from the way things were supposed to be. I hated my mom for uh, not loving me, for not wanting to raise me. I wish I could say things really stopped there, but they don't. They get a little darker. I remember when I'm still five or six, my brother, remember, he's four or five. That's the age we're at. There'd be some nights after my grandparents got custody of us that we'd spend a night on the weekends with our mom. And uh, tell you the truth, there are some days we did not know if we were going to eat over the weekend. Uh, We didn't know what was going to happen. There are some weekends where we'd spend a night with our mom. She'd look at us. She'd greet us at the door, take us. Grandparents and her would argue. She'd come back in. They'd shut the door. And then my mom immediately Friday night would tell us, all right, boys, sleep on the floor. And so we're in the kitchen, the floor, you know, it seemed to get dirty, more dirty ever as the weeks go by. You know, the, there was stuff that spilled that just crusted all over the floor. There were cockroaches. Occasionally, we'd get these little thing called mouses or rats or r- mice, whatever. I I'm not very smart. The poor form of mouse, okay? And so sometimes then those things would bite us at night, and good night, it would hurt. If you've ever been bitten, it is not good. But we'd sleep all night on this floor. We wouldn't have a pillow to sleep on. We wouldn't have a blanket. We'd use our arms. And sometimes my brother and I, we would just stare at each other. We'd cry as we fall asleep. Well, then the next morning we'd come up. We'd go knock on mama's door. And we'd, we'd talk to her. We'd say, hey, mom, uh, we're hungry. Uh, can we eat now? She'd look at us and say, not yet, boys. You guys go back to bed. In a couple hours, I'll get up and cook you something. So we said, okay. We'd try to go back to bed. We'd wake up a couple hours later, say, hey, mom. She'd wake up, she'd start screaming at us, you know, she'd grab us by the arm, put us back down on the floor. She said, I told you, she'd say some things that are questionable, go back to bed right now. And so we'd sleep, afternoon comes along, like, hey mom, can we have something to eat now? She said, nope, go back to bed. And then that was not an uncommon thing. It would go like that throughout the entire evening. And then um, things like that would happen. Sunday would come along, and then grandma and grandpa would look at us and say, hey, you boys want anything to eat? And we'd say, yeah, we're hungry. Things like that would happen, but when we stayed with our grandparents, I just recently started sharing this because of what we came around to churches. Church, that wasn't an easy time either. There would be days where my grandfather, he would take my brother and I, and just to tell you the truth, he would molest us. After he was done, he'd grab us by the arm, he'd yell at us and throw us out of the room, and there were days we did not know what we were going to get into, but when I grew up, four years went by, I turned nine years old, I after my grandparents took me to a doctor's office, a month later, the DNA results came back, and I remember meeting my dad for the first time in my life. And I grew up that way. That was not uncommon for me. Sometimes we would not eat on the weekends. Our grandparents would molest us very often. You know, church, I hated them. I hated my family. I hated growing up. As I become a teenager, I remember, as ashamed as I am to tell you this, I remember looking at God, hating him too, saying, God, if you really love me so much, then why was I passed around to my family? If you really loved me so much, then why was I molested? God, if you loved me, why didn't you stop this when you could have stopped it? And I might have hated him, but I praise God he didn't hate me back. But, you know, that goes on. And as I'm a teenager, there were days I would lay down in my bed. I'd go to sleep. I'd wake up. I'd open my eyes, and I would just stare at the wall. I'd stare at the floor for several minutes wondering why did I have to wake up today because I didn't want to. There were days I just realized it was better for me to die than to spend one more day in my family, and I did not want to go on. But when I turned 15 years old, that's when God did something exciting for me, church. I got taken out of a public school. I was placed in a Christian school, and I know you, you, I know you know what I'm going to say, but I hated that thing too. I did not want to be there. You know, look at my friends now. They had both parents in the same house growing up. They laughed all the time. They made friends easily, and it ate me up to see that. But then our youth director took God's word, and he preached a short message from Romans 6.23. And he said, for the wages of sin is death. And church, he was very plainly spoken about that word wages. He said that our reward, our punishment, our penalty for the things that you and I have done wrong is that we are going to die one day, and there is nothing we can do to escape our appointment with death. And then he took it a step further and spoke about the second death, that because of our rebellion to a holy God or our unbelief, unbelief in his son Jesus Christ he said we will die one day and we will go to a real place called hell I remember sitting there in my pew trying my best to talk to God I looked up to the ceiling saying well I guess you hate me too now I don't know if you know what it's like to cry yourself to sleep out of anger 
That's how angry I was. I think my mom, my dad, my grandparents, and now God doesn't even want me. And I don't know how he did it the next day, church. I really don't. I don't know how when that next day came. I don't know how God knew how to tear down the walls I'd set up. I don't know how he knew how to get past my barriers, but I praise God he knows how to do things like that because the next day I remembered the rest of his message that said, yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord began speaking about how he was born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross, rose again from the grave, and then he said something I never forgot. Y'all ready for it? He said, oh, and by the way, he loves you. I don't know how he did it, but I'm glad he did, because for the first time in my life, I realized that I wasn't someone to be used for their own ends. I realized I wasn't an accident. I realized that my life might have had meaning because of one thing, because there is a God in heaven who looked down on me He knew my name, and he told me that I'm never going to leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm not going to use you and cast you away afterwards. God saved me that next day when I trusted him as my Savior in church. I don't know if your lives were much harder than mine, and I don't know if they were a little easier than mine. But what I do know is that there is a God in heaven who wants to meet you right where you're sitting at today. And if you don't know him as your Savior, I am asking you, I am pleading with you, please come to know him. We want to do big things in Columbia. We want to see churches started. We're asking God to give us men to train to pastor those churches. And you know, church, as the years go by, I want to see the day at the end of our lives where he will never call another missionary to Columbia again. But that's only because national people have said, you know, that's all right. I've gotten saved, and I'm going to win my own country with the gospel. might sound impossible, but I think I read in a book somewhere we have a God who can do the impossible. Thank you so much. I have Lake, I thought you was going to start preaching there for a minute. That was good. Wasn't that good? Amen. Great, great, great. Uh, Karen, a quick, quick verse or no? Y'all look surprised. We're going to say one more verse so y'all can absorb what Blake had to say. And then uh, Chesley's going to come up and uh, share with us. Came from a totally different background. So it's interesting. I'm glad they're... They are both here today to let you see a guy that <laughs> grew up in a rough neighborhood and a fellow that grew up in a pastor's home. And uh, we'll see what God has for you. Okay, Brian. All right, second time today. Grab those hymn books, page 477, and we'll just sing the first verse of At Calvary. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Chesley Howell. Hey, Chesley. We had a good time together last night, didn't we? We did give Blake a hard time, didn't we? Yeah, but it's all right. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you all so much for allowing me to come. And my name is Chesley Howell. I'm a uh, church planting missionary to Columbia, former friend of Blake Young. But I'm going to teach a little bit on forgiveness and grace and bitterness. So maybe Blake will get right with God before we leave here. But yes, (laughs) I'm a missionary to Columbia as well. And I remember... um, I went to Columbia and visited uh, Miguel Sanabria, who had a huge impact on Blake, and he had a huge impact on my life. And I remember when I went to uh, Vision to go to to school there, Blake was the first one to call me up and be like, hey, man, you want to come over and and drink some Cokes because we don't drink beer? No, he said, you got to come over, you know, and and have dinner. And it was was really awesome. He was the first one to reach out to me. But um, we'll watch the video for, it's about a four-minute video, and then I'll get up and, uh, and talk a little bit about the Bible and what we can do for missions. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My name is Chesley Hell, and I am a church planning missionary to the country of Columbia. When I was eight years old, I knelt down on my knees beside my bed, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my one and only true Savior by grace through faith. When I turned 13, I watched on TV as 9-11 happened, and a terrorist crashed 
two airplanes into our Twin Towers. At the age of 18, I joined the United States Navy. But one thing I noticed as I traveled around the world is that everywhere you go, there are no churches that tri preach the gospel. When you talk to people about religion, about what they believe, they believe that they're going to heaven by their good works and by working hard to stay out of hell. They have no idea of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Lord used a mission trip to Colombia to call me to be a missionary to Colombia. When I was in Colombia, we traveled to the Venezuelan border and I saw thousands and thousands and thousands of people crossing the border. They're looking for food, for water, for just the basic necessity of life and for religion. They found the food, they found the water, they found the necessities, but they didn't find the true religion. I saw as people would go to the cathedral and they would pray to God, they would pray to Jesus, they would pray to Mary, they would pray to the saints and they would light candles and they would give offerings, but they were praying to a God that wasn't gonna hear their prayers. He wasn't gonna help them. He wasn't gonna give them food. He wasn't gonna give them eternal life. He wasn't gonna give them water. He wasn't gonna give them anything because it wasn't the true God. It wasn't a real God that they were praying to. Colombia is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever seen in my entire life. The giant Andes Mountains rise up and go through the center of the country with breathtaking views. It has a coastline on the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean with crystal clear water and islands scattered along the coast. It has the plains over towards Venezuela and down in the south it has the Amazon jungle with thousands of plants and thousands of animals. Columbia also has some of the most fertile soil in the world for growing all types of fruits, vegetables, and some of the most amazing coffee. The one thing that Columbia does not have diversity in though is its religion. More than 80% of the people are Roman Catholic. We went down to the Amazon jungle and we rode a boat up and down the jungle and we stopped to village after village. And the first thing I would look for in each village was a church, a place where people could go and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they had so many religions in the jungle. They had the, the God of the river, the God of the fish, the God of the birds, the God of the sun, but none of them were the true God that was gonna give them eternal life. On the last day we were in Colombia, I stood above the city and I looked over the city and you could see thousands and thousands of lights lighting up the city. And I thought each and every day, one of those lights burns out, never to shine its light again, never to show a path for a person to walk. And each and every day, thousands and thousands of people in the city die and they go to a place they were never expecting to go a place they didn't know they were going to, a place they had worked their entire lives, praying their entire lives, and giving their entire lives to stay out of. They're gonna go to hell. No one went to go and tell them. No one told them that for by grace are you saved. No one told them that it wasn't of our works. No one gave them the gospel. Lord, use that to break my heart and to say, Chesley, why don't you go? Why don't you go and tell these people about what I've done for them? Tell them about the gospel. Tell them about how I've died on the cross for them. The Lord called me to be a missionary to Columbia. I ask that you would pray for me. Pray for me as I go through deportation. The Lord would give me wisdom. That he would help me raise my funds quickly and efficiently. I also ask that you to pray that the Lord would send more laborers. That more people would give their lives to go. One of the things that I love so much about me and Blake going to work in Columbia and Miguel, who's there now, is, and uh, if, as you saw in the video, that those last few scenes are videos from Miguel's church, which he started about four years ago, and he has about, I think, 50 people there right before COVID, and hopefully be starting a new church soon, um, as soon as Blake gets there, and then uh, hopefully when I get there, we'll start another one, I don't know. But, you know, a goal is to have as many churches as possible all over Columbia. But one thing I really love about going to work with Blake and Miguel is all three of us come from a very different background. And one thing that I love about our Lord, our Savior, and our God is that he can use any single one of us, no matter what our background, no matter where we come from, how old we are, how young we are, he can use us for his glory and to do his work. 
And I think it's amazing that me and Blake are both going to be going to Columbia. We're going to be doing the exact same thing, trying to start churches, train guys to pastor those churches, despite the fact that we both come from completely different backgrounds. And see, like Blake said, he came from a uh, more of a rougher home. I'm the soft guy here. You know, I grew up, you know, in the, the hammock with the, you know, I'm just kidding. But um, I grew up in a pastor's home, and, you know, I was being drugged to church before I was even born. You know, my mom was in church every single Sunday with me in her belly. And, you know, it was like every single Sunday I was at church. Then I was born, and I still went to church. Like, I don't remember a Sunday that I missed unless I was sick. Always in church, always hearing the Word of God. And, you know, before I was saved, I had known, I knew the Romans Road. I had memorized most of it. And, you know, I knew Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I knew John three sixteen. But at 8 years old, we came home from church on a Sunday afternoon, and I laid awake in my bed all night long thinking, man, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. And in the morning when I woke up, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and it was, the, it was the best day of my life. It's like the next day, I couldn't wait to wake up and read my Bible. And I'd start waking up at 5 in the morning every morning and reading my Bible, and I was so excited about it. But then as you saw in the video 13, I saw 9-11, and I was like, I want to join the Navy. And I joined the Navy, and it really opened my eyes to the need of the world. Because before that, I thought that every single person had heard of the gospel in the world. I thought every single person at least, at least knew Ephesians 2, 8, 9, or John 3, 16. I thought everyone knew of the gospel, because I did. I grew up with it my whole entire life. And every single house in our, or building in our uh, neighborhood or, or in our uh, city where I was growing up, which was only 12,000 people, we had knocked on every single door through growing up and put a track on their door. So I thought the people that aren't saved are people who know the gospel and they rejected it. They didn't want it. But then when we started traveling, I started realizing that there are many people who had never, ever heard of the gospel. And I got out of the Navy, and when I got out of the Navy, I was going to church in San Diego, and there was a, a retired man in our church from the Navy. He used to be a Navy SEAL, and he had started a diving company and um, operating underwater robots. And I love scuba diving. Like, I would go every, almost every single night after church, I'd go over to the beach, and we'd go scuba diving for lobsters and stuff. So uh, the, the pastor's wife said, why don't you go talk to him and see if you can get a job from him when you get out? So I went and talked to him. He said, sure. So I went home for a year, worked on the railroad, came back and worked for him. And that's where I've been working the last 10 years in San Diego as a commercial diver and operating underwater robots. And at first it started like oil and gas, and then we were really good at operating the robots. So we started training um, SEALs and EOD techs and uh, Marine Recon and all kinds of different groups like that. And it was fun, and it was awesome. I loved my job every single day. I mean, who doesn't want to get up and go get on a boat and go out to sea and, you know, just... You know, I would hang my hammock in the back of the boat, and I mean, it was wonderful. I loved it. But as we traveled places, I kept thinking in my mind, these people don't have the gospel. They don't know the gospel. And I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I would think, Lord, what am I doing with my life? I am wasting it. It's just going straight down the drain. And I would go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and I'd go, um, you know, on Thursdays when they had visitation and Saturday mornings, and then I would go, you know, on work days on Saturday, and I kept going to church. I mean, every time the doors were open, I would try to go. And I, I mean, I've always tied my entire life, but I started trying to see how much money I can give to God. It was a challenge in my mind that I came up with. And I was like, I'm going to give 15% this year. And then the next year, I'm going to try to give 20%. And then the next year, I'm going to try to give 25%. And I kept trying to give and give more to God. But as I travel around, I love my job. I love my church. I love San Diego. And I know the politics are terrible, but, you know, the ocean was only three miles away. And Mexico was only three miles away. And I really enjoyed it. There's mountains there and everything else despite, you know, the politics. But, you know, it was really great. And I kept thinking, like, Lord, like, I really love working here. I love being here. And I was giving them to everything, but I would see the need all around the world. And I just kept thinking in my mind, what am I doing with my life? I am wasting it right now. And the Lord started working in my heart towards missions. Every day I would get up and I would walk out of my house and I'd take my dog for a walk and I'd come back and put him in the house. And I'd look over and right across the border in Mexico, there was a cathedral sitting up on a hill there. And I would look at the cathedral, and I would think, those people are working so hard not to go to hell, but yet they're going to die, and they're going to go to hell. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm not really working that hard. I mean, I go to church, and I do all these things, but I'm not trying that hard to keep those people, to tell those people about Christ and not, not going to hell. And it's like the Lord just kept burning my heart more and more for missions. And the more and more you give, I think the more and the more the Lord, the Lord asks, and the more and more he uses you. And finally, I was like, you have nothing left to give, Chesley. Why don't you give your life? And I thought, man, Lord, I don't think I can do it. I can't do it. I don't know how to public speak in front of people. I get nervous. I, I trip over my words. I, you know, my knees start shaking. My arms start shaking. I can't do that. And I can't go overseas. Like, how do I get from here and go to a whole other country where I don't know the language? I don't know the culture. How do I go there and tell those people about Jesus? 
But God can use anyone. He can use every single one of us here. And I was just thinking like, man, Lord, and finally, you know, I read in uh, Proverbs 3, you know, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And I kind of made that my verse. I just said, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And surely, as you saw in the video, the Lord, um, I went to school to go be a missionary, and the Lord called me to Columbia. But I just want to encourage you tonight is that God can use every single one of us. It's like me, Blake, and Miguel, we all have completely diverse backgrounds, completely different situations that we grew up in and where we came from. But God uses every single one of us. And one of the things, first things when I go to church, everybody's like, oh, you're single. That's like the first thing they always say. And I'm like, yes, sir, I'm single. And that's like, you know what? God can still use someone that's single. He can use someone that's married. He can use someone that has a married and has a young kid, the, the greatest kid in the world, Willow. You know, God can use every single person, no matter what your background, no matter what your adversity, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're old, whether you're young, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. God has a specific thing for you to do. He has something that he wants you to do. And that's the first thing. And the second thing is God wants people to be saved all over the world. It's like I was thinking, you know, as we were working and traveling, I was like, there are so many people all over the world that don't have the gospel. And we go to church and we are like, you know, we come to church every single Sunday, and we have the privilege of going to church. We have the privilege of going up in a country where it is free to worship God. We rarely suffer any persecution. You know, the most persecution I've had is someone making fun of me for that I'm a Christian, I go to church, which isn't that difficult to overcome, you know. But we grew up in a wonderful, free country where we can do what we want as we please and worship who we want to worship. But there are so many people around the world that have never heard the gospel. They don't know of Christ. we got to do something to tell them. And I know you guys support a lot of missionaries, and I was thinking of, you know, Miguel's church is there, and it's there because the church is just like this, that support missionaries to go. But we have to do something. There's something for all of us to do in Christ's family for his work. And I think of the Great Commission, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And I think of the great uh, commandment as well. It's like, thou shalt love thy neighbor, or thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's God commands us to go into the world and tell the gospel to everyone. He also commands us to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And we can't tell others about Christ without loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And we can't love God without telling others. We can't tell others without loving God. We can't tell others without loving our neighbor. And we can't love our neighbor without wanting to go and tell them, about Christ. So I challenge you as we leave here, like, one, we have, there are so many people in Greensboro. Me and Pastor were talking the other day. It's like, you know, there's, I don't know how many people are in, in this area, but, you know, for every million people, there might be one Christian. We got a lot of work to do here. We have a lot of work to do in Columbia. We have a lot of work to do all over the world, and God's commanded us to do his work. So I just challenge you to go out this week. Man, just do the work of God. Tell people about Christ, and everything we should do should be focused on telling others about Christ here in North Carolina, I had to remember where I was for a second, and all over the world. So I challenge you. Thank you, Pastor. Hey, those guys talk fast, don't they? <laughs> they did good. They did good. They blessed my heart. Really did. Y'all pray for them. Um, I know we have 40 missionaries, and they seem like they're going to a place. Remember, I told Blake this last night. I told uh, Simi Chesley this last night. Uh, he didn't know it, but uh, Columbia is one of the top 50 nations that persecute Christians. And he said he was down there walking the streets, never had any problem with anything. So I don't know where it is. You know, maybe may some Baptists going down there to buy cocaine. I don't know, and they're the ones that are persecuted. But you enjoy that? Good, good, good. Uh, take to heart what they say. I'm going to give them each about five or six minutes during the service to share something else with you, whatever's on their heart. Uh, McGill, I remember you, he got saved at the church in Florida when he was about Georgia, 12 years old. Isn't that something? He's gone back to be a missionary to Columbia. Wow. When I hear Columbia, I think of cocaine. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why. But, it, you know, maybe it's a movie I saw years ago or anyway. Uh, <laughs> you guys be good when you go down there, okay? Now, we got some coffee and some juice over at the um, building behind the church if y'all want some. Of course, we have a nice taco bar planned for after the service today. And I enjoy you, you guys' spirit. You got a good spirit. Um, keep on. Keep on, okay? 
Now, how long have you been, Blake, how long have you been on deputation? Two years. And you've been praying. You and your wife have been praying for this guy to get in, right? Yeah, or, or get saved. Which one? Get in or get saved, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, you, Blake just started in October. And then COVID, you know, and hard to get any places. But he was telling me he's got uh, booked up through about June. So um, y'all pray for these young men. They're young men that's given up good lives to go to a place I wouldn't want to go, you know. And uh, sacrifice is part of being in God's service, and people sometimes don't get it. Worship is sacrifice. Serving is sacrifice, and um, that's good. So let's have a word of prayer, and I hope that y'all did good. Y'all did good. You did real well. Two points. No, let's have a word of prayer. Father, uh, my heart was blessed uh, just to hear the hearts of these two young men and to realize again we live in a, a lost world, a world that's so in need of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that you would touch all of our hearts to desire to be a better witness for you everywhere we turn. Let us be a light, even here first among our own church and then to our families, of course, at home. And then to everybody we rub shoulders with, Lord. So, God, we ask your blessings on the rest of this day. In Jesus Christ's precious name.